G'day, it's Prezo back in the shop and we're still working on this which is an Art Deco inspired Lixi digital clock which uses an edge lit acrylic display. Today though we're going to do some metal working and I, I'm guessing that a lot of people have been hanging out for some metal working in this project. The piece we're going to make is this brass bezel. Now it is fabricated from quarter inch by quarter inch by one sixteenth of an inch brass stock and also from some flat stock to make these little decorative elements top and bottom. Now although this material is quarter inch by quarter of an inch I just thought it looked a bit chunky having the full quarter inch on this face of the bezel so it's going to be machined back to four and a half millimeters. The corners are going to be mitered and silver soldered together and this little decorative piece is going to be fitted into a milled pocket and silver soldered in place later. We're then going to polish the whole assembly and we're going to nickel plate it to finish. So let's not muck about, let's go next door to the metal shop and get started. Alright, so if you're wondering why I've already got one of these brass frames made, I'm actually making two of these clocks and when I did the first one I struggled through it and I think I've learned from all of my mistakes and one of the things I did learn was that you're better off to actually finish this brass before you join it together and make a frame. Uh, that way I can do all my draw filing and sanding and partial polishing before I make the mitre joints and silver solder this together. I must say I was terrified that I was going to catch this in uh, the buff when I was doing the final polish on it and uh, end up with it just mangled on the floor. So I'm going to cut this to length and then we'll do a semi-finishing process on this. Now just <clears throat> recently I bought myself a new vise and the original vise that I had was missing its vise jaws and I made new ones out of just mild steel and that served me well for you know like 20 years. And uh, just recently I was flush with cash and I thought oh what the hell let's, let's buy a new vise. Now in Australia you can buy these uh, from Trade Tools, this is a Renegade brand which is their own brand and it was a case of having almost instant buyer's remorse when I got it home. But the reason I bought this vise was that it has the jaws held on with uh, socket head screws which means that you can flip the jaws over. Now this came with uh, very severely serrated jaws and you see that I've just put some tape on that. but. I've turned these jaws around so that the smooth face is on the inside. So um, what I want to do is to avoid any really deep scratching of this as I work on it. That's why I've got the jaws turned around. What I'm going to do now is just draw file these surfaces until I've done both legs of the angle. Now when I say draw filing what I mean is you place the file flat on top of the stock you put your index fingers sort of almost touching over the center of the file and the rest of your fingers in front of the file and your thumbs go in the back and then you work the file along the length of the material. Now one of the things about doing this process is that it places the teeth of the file in a shearing mode so instead of gouging the material or tearing the material you are actually shaving it and it leaves you with a much finer finish and you can also tell just by looking at the bright points on the brass whether the material is bowed in the center or high in the center or high at the edges. Now in this case I know it's a bit hard to see in this light but this material is actually high on the two edges so when I draw file this I'm looking for it to be bright all the way across So just to give you some idea of just done that end there and then further down you may be able to see that it's still dull in the centre there. So that's telling me that that brass is not dead flat. You can see the file marks quite clearly there and they all run roughly in the same direction now. So I'll get the other one done and then we're going to give this a whirl on the Scotch-Brite wheel. 
This is my Scotch Bright wheel. This started off as a 200 millimeter diameter wheel. It's 50 millimeters thick. I'm not sure what grit uh, it is, but it's quite dense. And these things last forever. I think I've had this one for about five years. And uh, it cuts softer metals like aluminium and brass. So you've got to be a little bit careful with it, not to keep your stock in one place for too long. And on steel and stainless steel, you get that really nice grained effect. The only thing is that it's sort of now conical in shape um, and this edge is slightly rounded over. If anybody knows how you true these up, uh, just leave a comment uh, below there because I'd love to know. done and you can see the difference between the surfaces that are being treated on the outside and the inside of the angle and I'm not going to do these uh, edges just yet uh, because one of these has to be milled off. So to cut this stock down to four and a half millimeters across this top leg I'm just going to do it with a two flute uh, slot drill. I've got a piece of uh, brass stock which I can put underneath my angle just to raise it up off the the vice jaws so there's no chance that I'm going to hit my vice jaws with my slot drill so I'm not terribly worried about you know, tapping that down and getting that dead level it's just to trim this other leg back to four and a half millimeters so I'll take that stock out of there and I'm going to touch off with a cutter on this back side and then we're just going to do two cuts so I'm going to cut as a uh, conventional milling pass and leave about a half millimeter and then come back with a climb pass just to remove the last little bit. Okay, I'm just gonna check that with my caliper. Okay, I've got about 0.4 to go. So we'll do that as that climb pass on the way back. All right, so I'll just deburr that and then I'm just gonna move this along in the vise and do three individual cuts and that should finish that up. Now that I've got that stock cut to size, or at least cut to width, I can go ahead and cut the 45 degree mitres on the corners. Now, I've got one of these, this is called a multi-tool, and when you buy these, you're instructed to fit it to the right hand end of your grinder. And in that configuration, this, there's a platen behind the belt here, so that you've got something hard to press against, and it would normally be horizontal, and that allows you to do, say, face grinding, like that, you can use a contact wheel on the end for doing concaves and rounds and that sort of thing. But you don't have a fence and a lot of the work I do involves cutting stock square or cutting radii on the end of uh, flat stock and so on. So uh, I wanted to have this fence and there are a pair of fixing holes in the back of the belt there which are already existing in the assembly. So all I've done is I've made up this uh, quarter inch thick steel plate with the slot in it that fits around the belt and around around the platen in the back there. And to make it work, all you need to do is put a slight bend in that. So I'm not sure if you can see that, there's light shining through underneath there. And if you hold a square up against the platen, you can arrange this, get the right amount of bend in there so that your uh, fence or your table is truly square to the belt. Now that well, it's brilliant then. I've had that working for a number of years now. But to do these 45 degree mitres, it involves uh, cutting the stock with a hacksaw and then trying to get a mark on there that you can see. And it's not easy because you're holding the stock upside down. So what I did was I made up this little um, jig. It's just a piece of uh, six millimeter hot roll steel stock. 
I've made two edges dead square to each other on the mill and I've got a single 6mm socket head screw and I can set that to whatever angle I want and with that set to a true 45 degree angle I can then grind those edges quite easily. So let me get this set up and I'll just show you how that works. Right, with that um, jig there now I can run the stock in on either edge so I can go on the right hand edge to get that 45 degree mitre or I can flip that around and go on the other side and there are three holes in the auxiliary table so you can move it left and right depending on what you want to do so what I'm going to do now is I'll just rough trim one end of the long piece of stock and put it in place in the clock opening and then we'll just slowly bring it back to size So there's the first one done and what I need to do now is get this all assembled on the bench. Just check it to make sure it is giving me a true 90 degree angle. Well there it is sitting in there. Uh, it's pretty good in terms of the angle. So what I need to do now is down this end just get that roughed out with a sharpie mark or something like that. And I'm just going to gradually bring this back until it just fits in place. And it's one of those operations where you don't want to rush it. If you, <laughs> if you cut it too short, it's too short, and you're back to square one. So uh, let's just put a mark on there. Now, of course, when I turn that upside down, I'm not going to be able to see that mark. So I'm just going to transfer that onto the edge. Just so i got something to look at. Okay, so that's just a very rough guide at this stage. So um, we'll trim a bit more off and we're just going to suck it and see. Alright, that fits. So, with all that now cleaned up, and trimmed and mitered and so on. The last thing I need to do is just simply give these edges here a bit of a file. They, they've still got the milling machine marks on them. One thing I forgot to mention before when you're doing this draw filing process is that the way you grip the file prevents the file from rocking from side to side. So you've got to get your finger pressure over the very center of the work and then just try and keep your peripheral vision working on the ends of the file and just make sure that you're not rocking that as you go but in general you can control that file quite easily there's a little tiny depression here where the milling cutter uh, paused at the end of the cut and I've got to get that out and then we'll just give that a fine buff on the scotch bright wheel Okay, I think that's good. Let's just keep doing that. Right. There's that edge. It's looking pretty good. So we'll get this in the jig and we'll get it joined together. I'll just check that both ways, but this um, abomination here is the, the best I could do in terms of a jig to align everything while I get this silver soldered. So I've got a piece of uh, square aluminium tube. I've cut a notch out of the corner there, so I got you know, a sight line to the inside of the joint. And I didn't want to take too much heat out of the brass by heating up the aluminium tubing itself. A pair of toolmakers clamps to hold everything aligned and I've got them nipped up so that I can do a bit of tapping backwards and forwards to get everything where I want it to be. So I've cleaned the brass so that when we get this uh, fluxed up 
and start applying the silver solder it's going to flow freely and because of the the way it was ground there are micros microscopic little grooves in the face of the the mitre itself and they're going to allow the silver solder to draw into the joint by capillary action and that's important because we need to have a, a fully formed joint not just uh, silver solder sort of slathered on the outside of the joint done the silver solder there but at least that heated up quickly and I'm pretty sure that's penetrated through to the bottom of the joint. Well we'll get this cleaned up, have a look. Well that silver solder has penetrated right through the front of the joint. That was the underneath side when I was soldering. There's the back there. A bit of excess that I'm going to have to file out of that, but at least I've got a strong joint and that was the main thing I was trying to achieve. So let's go ahead now and get the other three joints done. I'm using a medium sized propane torch. That's mainly flux that you can see on the front there, but uh, it's going alright, let's get the, the last two in place. Okay, one silver soldered frame, so we're going to clean all this up now and so just do a, a clean of the flux mainly and then we're going to try and cut in the two little decorative parts on the front of the frame just there. Okay, well I've got a drawing which shows the dimensions of this little brass element that goes in the centre of the frame, so I'm going to mark that out with um, a one, two, three block. I've got my brass stock here and I've got my beautiful digital high cage and it probably seems like a bit of overkill to use something like this for a, such a simple job that um, I don't know if you've noticed but I've watched guys on YouTube marking out with a pair of digital calipers using them as a scribing block and I keep wanting to yell at the screen and saying it's a measuring tool not a bloody marking out tool but um, well here am I using my table saw as a surface plate so I guess I can't complain. Well, that's basically all there is to the first one and uh, I think I'll go ahead and cut this one out, cut it roughly and then square the end and then do a second one alongside it. So what I need to do now is take out these two little corner sections here. Now 
I know it looks odd, but this is the most accurate way of me being able to see these scribe lines as I cut out this square corner here. So putting in a device flat like that allows you to sight along the blade and keep your clearance away from that finish line. And then although you don't cut right through into the very corner, you just get a pair of pliers and just break that piece out. So on this piece at least, what I need to be able to do now is clean out these 90 degree corners. I've already finished uh, both the ends, so I've done this one and the one at the other end, and I need to finish the, the top edge as well. So I'm going to show you how I do this, and bear in mind I've got lousy eyesight, so <laughs> this is why I've developed this technique. If I was to try and file to this top line here, uh, what I would need to do is to grip this in the vise and then get my eye line down parallel with the top of the vise, which means sort of bending down and keep checking the line as you go, and of course that's prone to error. There's every chance you're going to overcut and go below the line. Once you've done that, that part is scrapped. The process I'm going to use here is I've got a piece of cold rolled steel and I'm going to use that as a filing gauge. So I'm going to position that cold roll in front of that scribe line there and get it accurate. Grip the whole sandwich in the vise and then just file down until you can see the file is just scuffing the top of that cold rolled steel. So there's my material that I need to take off and that's all the material above the surface of that cold rolled steel. Now you do have to be careful, you've got to sort of look at it very carefully, hold it in place and then grip the whole thing in the vise so nothing moves. And I usually get a magnifier and I just check that to make sure I've got it right. And then it's just a matter of just filing off that excess. I find when you're doing this sort of precision filing, the best solution is to hold the file somewhere near the middle, get the, the handle up underneath your wrist here, and that at least allows you to make the file an extension of your, your arm. And uh, you've got to lower your shoulder, get your elbow down in line with your forearm and your wrist and the extension of the file, and just push that through there. If it makes that horrible noise, just change the angle of your file. Always lift the file in the backstroke. That way you can see what you're doing. Just remember the file doesn't cut on the backstroke anyway, so if you're just backwards and forwards like that, all you're doing is covering up your work so you can't see what you're doing. Now that's just starting to scuff that cold rolled steel all the way through there. That's it done. Now just Bear in mind there's a second line there, it's not the one I was filing to, that was a mistake. <laughs> it's the top one that I was after and I've got that correct. So you can see in here there's a big chunk of brass and I need to get out of that corner there. So I'm going to put the safe edge, my file, that's the one with no teeth, against the vertical edge and just very carefully trim out that corner. See just a couple of strokes of the file were nearly there. Alright, that's down level with the top of that cold rolled. Oh, I feel like click spring. I don't know, what, what is it about that guy? He's like a, an alien that's been sent back from the future to make clocks. I watch his stuff and I just think, well, I, I couldn't even see what I was doing if I tried to replicate his techniques. But, um, man, I'd love to be able to do that. Okay, I think I hit that line. So we're just going to do that same process now for all of the other lines on there. Alright, let's go do this, this one vertical edge over here now. Okay, I reckon that's good. What I'll do now is just lightly draw file all of those edges and then we're going to mill the pocket in the frame to assemble this. Okay, I'll set this up in the mill vise uh, and I've got my brass stock underneath uh, the top leg of the angle just to raise it up above the, the vise jaws. 
and I've set the tooth to be right up against the scribe line on the left hand edge of the pocket and I've set my Z and my X uh, zeroed out in that position. So this is a 14 millimeter two flute slot drill. The pocket I need to cut is 32 millimeters wide so I'm going to do two passes at 14 and one at four to finish up and uh, when I get to that last one I'll just sneak up on it until it's right. I'll do it in two passes because this, just remember this is very flimsy this um, material and uh, that cut is not brand new. Alright, well there should be four millimeters left over again there. It looks more like five to me, but <laughs> I actually use the part to uh, get the pocket the right size rather than work off dimensions. Well, good thing I stopped there because that's almost dead on. My scribe line is not right. Not sure how I got that wrong. Well, I just solved the mystery. Um, I didn't bring this one right back to the scribe line. That's the one that I used to mark out both pockets. Uh, this one, this one here is correct. I just measured it with my caliper. It's 32. So uh, good thing I double checked. Eh? Take another cut. That's almost bang on. I'll probably clean it up with a file. Right, that um, material there is just going to break away. So we'll go and get this one cleaned up with a file and just see how it looks. course but get the idea okay other ones exactly the same so I'll do that and then we'll silver solder this part in Well, that flowed out really nicely along there. It sort of just zipped along uh, from the left. That last little blob melted away quite nicely. So um, we'll flip it over, see what it looks like, and then we'll do the other one. Well, that face there is nice and flat. It'll just take a light draw file to get that right. It's probably sticking out a little bit at the bottom there, but that, that's good. I can file that back. Well, this is the part that I hate doing <laughs> after you've done all this brazing. Everything distorts and everything moves. Um, I've spent a lot of time just trying to straighten this up. You can see it's still way out. Um, the good thing is that when you push it inside the clock frame, it basically comes back to rectangular anyway. But um, it was quite badly distorted in the centre here. The heat just made it expand. It just sort of popped up. But the brass being relatively soft means that you can reshape that pretty easily. So if we start on a corner like this one, there's always a little bit of silver solder that's flowed through onto that face there. And it's always, it's a different density or a different hardness to the brass. And it tends to be a little bit harder to file. So that's the issue. You tend to work on that. And at the same time, you're actually eroding away the brass on either side of the joint. 
So you've got to be a little bit vigilant about where the metal's coming off. And as soon as you start to file, you'll see a bright patch where the solder is. And you just kind of try to avoid filing too much beyond that corner. There's a little tiny pinhole right on that corner there. And I can almost hear that I'm through into the brass now. It's got a different sort of sound to it. So when you finish that process, you start sanding. And of course now you're trying to remove the fire marks. I made this little gadget specifically for this job. So this is like a little, um, what would you call it? It's like a band sander. So it's just a wedge shaped piece of wood with a cutout in it and a little piece of plywood so I can tension up that loop of emery cloth. And these were just made from a standard sheet of emery. Right, 25 millimeters wide and the joint is made with CA glue. So I've made up a whole bunch of these and you wear out basically one on every corner. So you may be able to see that right on this inside edge there's a little bit of a file mark which I need to get out. There it is there, you can see it better at that point. So this is just about being patient and sticking with it. So I'm not going to bore you with showing all this technique. We'll come back when I've got the corners done. We might just do one of the little decorative parts. Uh, there's that same corner done now. I've just done that on the Scotch Bright wheel. But it's not polished. All we've done is basically made it flat and removed the silver solder. So the polishing process comes next. And of course, I still need to do the inside corner, get rid of all that uh, silver solder and flux in there as well. So, yes, it's tedious, it's boring, it's no fun whatsoever, but it's got to be done. Uh, I've done a sort of preliminary cleanup of all of the four corners now. So um, what I need to do is get to work on the center part. So um, I'm just going to grip this whole thing in the vise and do the inside face first. Now it's going back to draw filing. So that's as much draw filing as I want to do. Okay, now I can work on this face. So it's going to be the same deal. Let's just start with draw filing. So there's a high spot where the silver solder lapped over that joint. That's clean, but it's certainly not flat. That is nowhere near being finished. There's like hours and hours of work to get this to the same stage that I've got the other one. But uh, I'll do it and we'll come back and have a look. Well, I've got this looking semi-respectable now. There's uh, another four or five hours work just to do the polish to get a mirror finish on this so we can do the nickel plating. And I'm gonna hold it over till the next video. To get it to this point, I had to sand all of this uh, inside edge here, because that's all going to be visible. Uh, even the back has to be done, even though this is all going to be hidden. If there's any oxide or any flux residue, the nickel plate won't take in those areas, so that all had to be cleaned as well. And really, the only way to do that is to get a piece of sandpaper like this and roll it up into a sort of a stick and just get in there and just do it like that. So. At this point, I've got no fingerprints left. They're all been sanded off, so if I want to go and rob a bank, now's the time. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no machine that I know of that can get in there and do that. Maybe bead blasting or something might work. But uh, I think we're getting close, and thanks for uh, sticking with me right through to the end of this video. I know it's a long one, but there's, there's always more to it than meets the eye when you make a part like this. So I'll check you out in the next video, and thanks for watching.